All right, everybody, uh, we are moving into the fifth act in our big picture series. This whole series is about seeing the Bible as one unified narrative from start to finish. So we've broken it up into eight different acts. We've covered the first four so far, and now we're on act five. What we've done is we've identified seven themes seven strands that connect the first pages of the Bible all the way to the last pages of the Bible. But we're not trying to get so lost in the details that we don't see that the Bible is one grand story. Now, so far, we've seen these four acts. God's creation of the Garden of Eden and him placing Adam and Eve there. We've seen his election or decision to pick Abraham to be a blessing to all the nations. We've seen the Exodus, where God delivers his people out of slavery in Egypt. And then we've seen the people enter into the promised land. Now, sometimes we can get lost in all these themes. So what I want to do is start with each one of these seven themes and connect them so far. How have we seen temple all the way through these Four themes and then land through these four uh, acts and so on and so forth. So this is going to be a little bit of a review, but I think it'll be helpful to see these strands, these threads that connect through each of these acts of the story. Okay, so I'll put a time marker if you want to skip to the major section on Act 5, uh, then we'll talk about that. But first of all, we see the idea of the temple already in Eden, even though there's not a man-made created temple, the whole universe is kind of depicted as God's temple. So we see that uh, the whole world is depicted as being created in seven days, and Solomon's temple was created in seven years. Uh, we see that Adam and Eve are called to work and serve in the garden, which the, is the exact same phrase that the priests had for uh, Solomon's temple. So they're being depicted as kind of priests in this garden. We see that uh, this whole depiction of the universe is not just uh, for the sake of understanding scientifically what our universe is like, but that all of creation is seen as a kind of temple where we worship God. We also see that they are kicked out of this holy temple. We see that they're, they depart east uh, away from Eden. And the reason why the direction east is so important is because the tabernacle and the temple also faced east. So if you exited the tabernacle or temple, you also went in that direction. So this idea of temple is crucial in the first 11 chapters of Genesis. Now, there's not as much idea of the temple uh, in Genesis 12 through 50. However, Abraham and his descendants will often worship God with altars. When there is no tabernacle and when there is no temple, that doesn't mean you don't worship God. That means you worship God wherever he shows up. And the famous phrase for this is when Jacob says, Surely the Lord was in this place and I did not know it. And he makes an altar in the same spot where he has a vision of God's connection between heaven and earth. So we don't see as much of the temple here, but it's still so important. God uh, decides, you know, God's people decide to make altars to say X marks the spot. This is where we need to worship God. We also see the temple uh, come around in the story of the Exodus because God instructs the Israelites to create a tabernacle. This is a mobile temple. This is a movable sanctuary. And God's presence fills the tabernacle, and it's so important that the, the tabernacle is in the center of the camp of the Israelites. That's just like uh, the fact that the tree of life was in the middle of the garden. So God's presence, God's abundant life is with them, even in the wilderness. We also see the theme of temple uh, really come about in the entrance into the promised land and when Solomon creates the temple. The temple is not uh, leaving behind the tabernacle or the Ark of the Covenant. What's so important about the temple is that it's a greater and perfected tabernacle. It takes all of the dimensions and depictions and art and beautiful craftsmanship of the tabernacle and expands it into a kind of 
permanent temple in Jerusalem. And those are perfectly fitting for each other, right? The Ark of the Covenant and the tabernacle is mobile. It's when they're wandering in the wilderness and they aren't in the promised land and they don't have a home. But now that they're in Israel, now that they're in the promised land, now that they have conquered Jerusalem, the temple is permanent. It's stable. God's presence fills it just like God's presence filled the tabernacle. We also see the theme of land through all of these uh all of these acts. So first of all, God creates an abundant land, an abundant garden called Eden, and there are rivers flowing from it. It is, uh, it is a well-watered land, and Adam and Eve are free to eat and enjoy that garden, but because of their sin, they're exiled away from the garden. And Cain even uses, when, when he's punished for his sin against his brother, he says, God, you are driving me from the land. We see that land is so crucial in Genesis 1 through 11. We see that God's flood is actually a kind of purification of the land. Then we see the promised land. First, that first time the promised land is mentioned in Genesis chapter 12, Abraham receives that promise he is going to have a land. But we see so much wandering in this section. And they eventually end up as slaves in the house in the land of Egypt. So God says, I'm going to bring you up out of this land and into the promised land. It's so important to know how crucial land is here. While they live in, in other territories outside of the promised land, they flounder. Their lives are squandered. They don't live to their true potential and in the abundant life that God wants for them. And so he delivers them up out of the land of Egypt and into the promised land. And that's why the, the land is so important in Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1st and 2nd Samuel, and 1st and 2nd Kings, they have arrived in the promised land that all, all the way back here in Genesis 12 was promised. We also see the idea of family constantly throughout these, these different acts. We see that family is so important in Eden. God thinks of Adam as his son. And we see later in the Gospels that Adam is referenced as the son of God. They are made in the image and likeness of God. There's a kind of family resemblance between God and humanity. And God wants his family to be fruitful and multiply. However, due to their sin and being exiled from the garden, childbearing is going to be difficult. And we see that outside of the Garden of Eden, childbearing is painful. And it's a, it's a difficult process. And so... There's a kind of punishment in laden with that. I wanted you to be fruitful and multiply, but now outside of Eden, it's not going to be the way I wanted it to be. However, God picks one family to be a blessing to all of the families of the earth. He doesn't just generically bless all families. He picks one family, blesses them, and then they're supposed to be a vehicle of blessing for the rest. So blessing starts with God blessing Adam and Eve in Eden, they experience the curse of sin, but then God still picks them to bless others. We see the idea of uh, blessing show up in the Exodus stories because Pharaoh sees the Israelites as a kind of curse. Because they're multiplying, they could attack him, overwhelm him, and so he enslaves them. They experience what it's like for Pharaoh to curse the Israelites. But God promised in Genesis chapter 12 that he would curse those who curse the Israelites. And so God brings upon, brings upon plagues to uh, Pharaoh and the rest of Egypt. Finally, we see their entrance into the land. And this is uh, a kind of interesting aspect of the theme of blessing because Moses warns them that if they don't obey the covenant, if they don't keep God's law, they are going to experience the curse of the law. He warns them about this. And so... When we see disobedience when they're in the land, that doesn't mean everything's fine. They experience the weight and consequences of their sin. We also see covenant as a crystal clear theme through all of these. God makes a covenant with Adam and Eve that they can rule over the, of the, over the Garden of Eden and be his priests as long as they don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But they break their side of the covenant. They're deceived by the serpent. And so they don't get to enjoy that rule and reign. They actually experience the serpent's power over them. When God is talking to Cain, he says, the serpent's desire is for you. Sin is crouching at the door, ready to pounce on you. And so they experience the distorted power of the enemy over them and over their lives. 
Then God, after Eden, renews his covenant, but with Noah. We see that God makes promises to Noah, and those are continued uh, into the story of Abraham. Now, this, the covenant that God makes with Abraham, we've repeated this many times, but it's very important. It is unilateral. It is one-sided. Abraham is asleep the entire time. This is all on God to fulfill the covenant that he makes with Abraham. The covenant is that he will make him into a great nation and he will bless him and bless others through him. And we see that happen throughout Genesis. Um, eventually, God remembers his covenant in Exodus. He brings them out of the land of Egypt and he makes another covenant with Moses at Sinai. But this covenant is a two-way street. The Israelites agree to the covenant at Sinai. This is important and it's an important difference between Abraham's covenant and Moses' covenant. We see that Joshua remembers the covenant as they're entering into the promised land. We see that they don't follow the covenant in, this, in the era of the judges, and we see the huge ramifications and evil that comes from them for getting the covenant throughout that story. And then God makes a covenant with David. This is the Davidic covenant, the covenant of the kingdom. He says that David will have an eternal dynasty. He is going to have a descendant who comes to power, who, who becomes king of Israel, and he's going to be king forever, okay? That, all of those covenants are going to come back in the New Testament. We also see the thread of wisdom for all the way from Eden through the entrance into the promised land. God creates the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. This is an alternative wisdom, a wisdom that doesn't come from God, and if they choose that, they're going to suffer the consequences. And that's what they do because they are deceived by a cunning or crafty or wise serpent who misuses wisdom to deceive them. We see throughout this time of, of Genesis 12 through 50 with Abraham and his family, so many foolish decisions being made. And we see them reap uh, what they sow. They experience the consequences of their behavior. And we see all this horrible family dynamics. We see sibling rivalry. We see murder. Uh, we see betrayal and deception, and that's all because they're not living wisely as God intends them. We see the theme of wisdom show up in the book of Exodus and through De Deuteronomy. Moses says that the law is a kind of form of wisdom, that if they obey the law, they're actually going to demonstrate to other nations that they are wise, and they're wise from God, but inevitably they don't. We see wisdom... Uh, kind of come to its fruition in the kingdom of Israel. This is the beginning of the creation of the wisdom literature. We see uh, the beginnings of the Psalms and Proverbs and Job and Ecclesiastes and Song of Solomon. However, they're collected over time and eventually formed and compiled together. We know that the wisdom literature had roots in the kingdom. Wisdom and kingdom are kind of always rooted together. God wants them to Adam and Eve to be wise so that they can rule, but when, whenever kings don't have wisdom, they don't rule well. They end up becoming more like Pharaoh, and that's actually what happens to all of the kings of Israel. And finally, we can see kingdom from start to finish, right? God is king over all things. He wants to share his kingdom with Adam and Eve. They reject that. They want to rule on their own terms, so he kicks them out. And so God picks one family to be a kind of kingdom that he is going to work through. He promises to Abraham, kings will come from you. He promises to his descendant, uh, Judah, that kings will come from Judah. That's going to be really important for the New Testament. Eventually, we see in the Exodus that God intends more for Israel than just to uh, leave the slavery in Egypt. He says, you will be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. He wants to make them into royalty. And finally, we see the entrance into the promised land, but we see a kind of difficulty with kingdom. Because on the one hand, God wants to make them into a kingdom of priests. He wants them to be a blessing to the world and mediate the world back to him. However, they want a human king like the other kings of the nations to replace God or to kind of be an obstacle to God. And God warns them what this is going to be like. This is not going to be good news in, in the long term. David and Solomon and Saul all have initial rises where their kingdoms are going well, but they inevitably have a fall. Saul becomes a madman and a, and a murderer by the end of his life. 
David becomes an adulterer. He kills uh, an innocent man. His family falls apart. Solomon starts really wise and things seem to be going well with him, but inevitably he marries many women to make kind of foreign treaties with other nations. And we see the kingdom falling apart. Okay, so these are the way these threads reach all the way through and they kind of weave together to make a tapestry, a large picture or mosaic where we can see the whole story all at once. Okay, that's the review. Now we're going to go to uh, Act 5, which is about the exile. All right, we are in Act 5, which is all about the exile. In the last act, we talked about how the kingdom of Israel was kind of falling apart. Each king, whether it was Saul, David, or Solomon, all began with a kind of rise to power that seemed to be looking good, but inevitably took a turn and had a fall. And we know intuitively that this is not going to last. There's going to be a crack in the kingdom, and that's exactly what happened. So I want to cover... Uh, a lot of books and so we are <laughs> we aren't going to be able to go into a lot of detail but we're mainly focusing on second kings we're doing all of the prophets daniel esther and ezra and nehemiah uh, this is going to be a lot of material so we need to uh, stay at a thirty thousand foot view in order to do this so here's the overall narrative that happens in these books so first of all we see the corruption and downfall of israel we see that things are not going well with God's people. Inevitably, we see that this is going, uh, this is not going to last. So what happens is there's a split in the kingdom. Sol Solomon's children inevitably uh, separate from each other, and they kind of take over the kingdom in their own regions. And so we see the creation of northern Israel and southern Judah. Now, that's kind of strange because typically we use the word Israel to talk about all of the Israelites, but that term is just used to talk about the northern kingdom, and Judah is used to describe the southern kingdom. So we see a split in the kingdom. It used to be unified under Saul, David, and Solomon, but now it's split. Now, due to even more corruption over all the different kings that come in the north and all the different kings that come from the south, we see that northern Israel is destroyed by the kingdom of Assyria. Um, uh, due to prayer and reliance upon God, southern Judah is saved and not initially destroyed by the Assyrian Empire. But it's only a matter of time before the Babylonian Empire, which took over Assyria, inevitably comes and destroys the southern part of the kingdom. Now, some of these books are about life in exile, specifically Daniel and Esther show us what it's like for the Israelites to be away from the land under oppressive kingdoms, but also being faithful in the midst of persecution. So we see Daniel is under the empire of Babylon, and he specifically deals with the king Nebuchadnezzar. We see Esther under a later kingdom uh, of the Persian empire and she tries to live faithfully in the midst of that but for both of those we see the israelites away from the land trying to live faithfully to god and then we see in the persian empire a partial return to the land this is where the stories of ezra and nehemiah come in those used to be one book but we actually separate them out into two books so this is the kind of overarching narrative of the story. The downfall of Israel, the split of the kingdom, the destruction of the north, then the destruction of the south. We see what life is like in the exile, and then we see a kind of partial return to the land. And partial is so important here. Just like the conquest, which was not complete, we see that the return to Israel is not complete either. There's an attempt to rebuild, but it's just not to the former glory of Israel before. Um, the cast of this act of the play can be very overwhelming, especially when you get lost in all the details of every single king in the north and the south. It gets very hard to track. So what I do is I try to understand this cast by categories. And I didn't know how else to put this other than that most of these kings are mostly bad. If you look at the descriptions of the kings in the northern kingdom of Israel, 
They're all bad. They don't do what is right in the eyes of the Lord. And even in the southern king of Judah, southern kingdom of Judah, we don't get many good kings either. And even the ones that do right in the eyes of the Lord often will fail in other ways. So I like to think of it as mostly bad kings of Israel. Then you get the prophets. And one way of thinking about these is before, during, and after the exile. Because prophets go all the way back to Samuel, and he existed before King Saul. So the prophet, that role, exists prior to the kingdom of Israel and after its destruction. So one way of thinking about his prophets pre-exile, during the exile, and post-exile. Now, this next category is kind of strange, but I like to think of this section in trying to figure out the relationship between Israel and the nations. Because on the one hand, Israel makes foolish treaties with foreign nations, and they end up getting devastated by those foreign nations. However, at the same time, the nations begin to be an object of hope for the Israelites. One day, the prophets envision that the nations will stream to Zion and worship the God of Israel. Now, this is really crucial because God said that Abraham's descendants would be, Abraham's family, excuse me, would be a blessing to the nations. God was going to bless Abraham and then bless everyone else through him. And whoever blesses Abraham would be blessed. And we're seeing that vision come into focus. And we're seeing that there's going to be a way for the nations who typically worship the pagan gods are now going to worship the one true God of Israel. Some other uh, characters that we've already mentioned, Daniel and Esther, they are both important characters who live away from the land, out in exile, and are trying to be faithful to God. We see later, after Daniel and Esther, Ezra and Nehemiah, uh, they come, uh, when, when they come back to the land, uh, they're living under the Persian kings. Um, and finally, there's this very important character whose image is being filled out. This is the long-awaited Messiah. The prophets are all envisioning and have uh, word, the word of the Lord comes to them. And often they see this character uh, who is going to restore the kingdom of Israel. He's going to defeat the enemies of Israel. He is going to be a royal figure, and all of these images are kind of helping us to see that there's going to be a character at some point in the future who fulfills all of these prophetic words. And you and I know, as people who read the New Testament, that Jesus is going to fulfill these images. But I want us to think, whenever we get to the New Testament, about how this character really comes into focus and how the expectations around the Messiah are fulfilled in Jesus completely, but sometimes in strange ways, sometimes in an order that people don't expect, and sometimes to a degree that people don't fully realize. So that's the cast, and that's uh, really important. All right, let's get into the seven themes of Act 5, which we're calling Exile. First of all, we see the temple theme come up regularly. Now, before this, we saw that the temple created by Solomon was a perfected and greater tabernacle. It was a permanent sanctuary for God in Jerusalem in the Promised Land, but over time, its practices became corrupt, and the people in charge of the temple started to care more about the animal sacrifices for the sake of forgiveness than the actual transformation of the heart and our characters. So it's not that the animal sacrifices were a bad thing. It's that they were deprioritizing uh, justice. They didn't care about the orphan and the poor and the widow. They cared more about the animal sacrifices being carried out in the temple. But the whole point is in forgiveness is to be changed and transformed into the image of God. And so these the, the temple that has so much glory because of God's presence is being corrupted by the people in charge of it. So God leaves the temple. 
This is a vision that Ezekiel has where the glorious presence of the Lord vacates the temple. And nothing could be more devastating than this. God's presence is where you want to be. God's presence in the tabernacle was in the center of the camp of the Israelites in the wilderness. God's presence walked uh, in the Garden of Eden. You want to be around God's presence. And so when God's presence leaves, that's bad news. And we see that fulfilled in the destruction of the temple by the Babylonian Empire who sweeps into southern Judah, destroys and sacks Jerusalem, and defiles the temple. Now, later, a lot later, Ezra and Nehemiah return. There's a number of Israelites, not all of the Israelites, but a number of them who come back to the land and rebuild the temple. And at first, there's a lot of excitement growing. God is going to return. His glorious presence will fill this rebuilt temple, and we're going to start the second temple. But it is not a return to its former glory. God's presence does not fulfill this rebuilt temple. So there's a question hanging at the end of the Old Testament, when will God's presence and glory return to Israel? When will God come back? Now, the second theme, land, is obviously crucial during this act called exile because the the promised land, which they were so so for so long away from in Genesis through Deuteronomy, they finally were given the land through the conquest of Joshua, the, the fact that they failed in the land throughout the time of Judges. All of this is made worse because now the Israelites are being kicked out of the land. They had examples to warn them. Adam and Eve were kicked out of the garden. Cain says, I'm being driven away from the land after he sins by murdering his brother. This is not due to an unjust God not caring about his people. This is due to the sin of the Israelites. God gave them plenty of warnings ahead of time. This is what all the prophets were doing. If you don't remember the Torah, if you don't keep God's covenant, you're going to be kicked out of the land. And in fact, there are just some really interesting images about the land in, in terms of the exile. So uh, the land is, is said to be given rest from the Israelites. It's as if the Israelites have worn the land dry and have worn it into dust. The same language that is used for the Canaanites being vomited out of the land is also used for the Israelites being vomited out of the land. They corrupt the very territory and gift of the land that God gave to them. This is a pattern that we see play out in Act 5. We also see the theme of blessing. The prophets are constantly saying, from God that God wants to bless the Israelites and he wants to bless the world through them but because of their disobedience they're going to experience the curse of disobedience and God sees and shows the prophets a vision of the future where Israel will be a blessing they will fulfill the promise that God made to Abraham. They will be a blessing to all of the nations. And even Nehemiah uses this very interesting phrase in the, in the beginning of his book. He says God can turn even curses into blessing. And I think we're going to see this play out in the New Testament in a really interesting way. The theme of covenant is so clear throughout this time of exile. We see the prophets almost acting like lawyers, bringing a case from God against Israel, saying, you did not keep your covenant. Remember, the Mosaic covenant, in distinction from the covenant made to Abraham, is a two-way street. They agreed over and over and over again to follow the covenant that God made with Moses on Mount Sinai. They said, we will obey the laws. And Moses warned them, if you disobey the laws, you'll experience a curse. And so now God is bringing all of these charges. He's been very patient with them. He's reminded them countless times to keep the covenant. And now God is bringing his case. And the people are kind of like defendants trying to argue their case that they're innocent, but they fail. God wins the court case. Eventually, he starts to describe his relationship with Israel, not just as a king over servants, but as a husband who has been betrayed by his wife. And the imagery is really important there. God experiences this infidelity from his people. They agreed 
to be faithful to him, and they haven't. They've gone after other gods, they've forgotten his covenant, and they don't care about their metaphorical husband, the Lord. And so it's almost an image of a, of a marriage falling apart. And we see this especially in the prophet Hosea. God tells Hosea to marry a prostitute. This is an image of God's relationship to Israel. They keep going after other gods. And he'll use the language of prostitution. This is how deeply God cares about his covenant and his promises made with his people. The theme of kingdom is clear in the act of exile. We see the split of the kingdom. We see the corruption of all the kings. And then we see that other kingdoms come to rule Israel. This is like a flashback all the way to the days of Egypt. God brought them out from slavery under Pharaoh so that they could be under his rule and reign and share in his kingdom. He said that he wanted them to be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. But now due to their sin and disobedience, God gives them over to other kingdoms like Assyria and Babylon and Persia. They are ruled by others. We also see the theme of family play out. We see the, the ten tribes of Israel, of northern Israel, are scattered. They're dispersed throughout the world. They're deported to other countries. We also see that the, the divine family that God wanted from the beginning, he, he often referred to Israel as his son. And this divine family is being broken up. Israel is unfaithful to God, and they are wayward sons. Uh, we see the theme of family show up in both Ezra and Esther. Uh, Ezra, when he returns to the land, counts all of the families and realizes that not everybody has come back. And this is seen as a very disappointing letdown. Not all of Israel has returned to the land. Just like there is a partial conquest of the land through Joshua, there's a partial return in the time of Ezra. We also see that Esther, in her attempting to save the Jews, is... Uh, it's referred to uh, her family, uh, excuse me, her tribe, the Jews, is seen as a kind of threat to her family whenever the, whenever the king is tempted to issue an order against them. And so we see this theme of family even in Esther's story. We also see the theme of wisdom continued. And I know that this is, may sound strange, but I think the, the wisdom literature that we have, I would group that as Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, and Job. We see kind of two patterns form, and it's really difficult to date the wisdom literature because it was collected over such a long period of time. But I like to think about the wisdom literature as kind of positive wisdom literature and negative wisdom literature. Not meant that there's, they're contradictory, but they complement one another. Wisdom has multiple sides to it. And so I think about the wisdom literature as the Proverbs and Song of Songs and the Psalms as this positive wisdom. But also we see the kind of negative side of wisdom like Ecclesiastes and Job. These are much darker forms of wisdom learned through suffering and difficulty. And this is wisdom learned through flourishing. And we see that come together after the exile. One way of thinking about the end of the Old Testament is thinking about nations and kings. We can think about Israel establishing its kingdom through Saul, David, and Solomon. These are the big three whose families inevitably come to a fall later on. We see that Assyria, led by Sennacherib and Tiglath-Pileser, sweep in and destroy the northern kingdom of Israel. That's where the creation of Samaria comes into place where these people of Jewish heritage also mix with uh, people from other areas. That's why the northern part of Israel in Jesus' time is full of Samaritans, okay? Uh, later on, the Babylonian Empire sweeps in and destroys us and takes over Assyria and then sweeps in and destroys southern Judah. That's under the king Nebuchadnezzar. We see the life of Daniel play out when Nebuchadnezzar takes some of the leading people of Israel, deports them back to his country in, in Babylon, his empire, and they have to try to live faithfully in the midst of that exile. Then we see the Persian Empire take over for, from Babylon, and we see King Cyrus and Artaxerxes, Arte, 
Uh, Esther's life plays out in the reign of Artaxerxes, and Ezra and Nehemiah's life plays out during the rule of Cyrus. We don't hear about this very much, but eventually the Greek Empire under Alexander the Great and other uh, Greek rulers comes to take the place of prominence that Persia once had, and then Rome takes over for the uh, Greek Empire. This actually is the empire for the time of Jesus. So this is a kind of timeline that you can see play out over the centuries. David's kingdom starts around 1000 BC, and Jesus is born 2,000 years ago, or 1,000 years after David. And all of these empires have come and gone. You see a theme throughout these, the rise and fall of these empires, that no kingdom lasts forever. No human, merely human kingdom lasts, because these kings will come into power, they will be corrupted by their power, and they'll misuse it against their people. And God will never let that last forever. And so the question at the end of the Old Testament is what kingdom and what good king will ever come to rule over the nations? You can see where that's headed in the New Testament. Now we've gone through the entire Old Testament in five acts. Eden, election, exodus, entrance, and exile. But at the end of the exile and the partial return through Ezra and Nehemiah, we have a lot of hanging questions. The end of the Old Testament is kind of like a cliffhanger. What's going to happen next? Because there's no, there's no temple filled with the presence of God. There's the second temple that's rebuilt, but it's not to its former glory. So when will God's presence return to the temple? Also, they were exiled from the promised land, and even though some returned, not all Israelites returned. But even the ones who did return are now ruled over by the Roman Empire and Caesar. The Mosaic Covenant, which was a two-way street that the Israelites agreed to, has been definitively broken. The prophets brought the case of God against the people, and they were unfaithful. They were not, they did not keep the covenant with God. They faced the curse of the covenant. They gathered a lot of wisdom literature in Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Solomon. However, they didn't live wisely. All of the kings, even Solomon, behaved foolishly. The kingdom of Israel is destroyed. So there's all of these questions hanging at the end of the Old Testament about temple and land and family and blessing and covenant and wisdom and kingdom. First of all, when will the temple be restored to its former glory? When will God's presence return? Will all of Israel return to the land and inherit that possession that God made, that God promised to Abraham? Will the family of Israel return? Will they be a blessing to the Lord? Will they ever be under the curse of the law, ever be out of the curse from under the law? Will the covenant that God made with Israel ever be renewed or fulfilled? Will they ever have a wise ruler? Will they ever be a wise people? And will God restore the kingdom of Israel? And that's the question that we'll answer next week in the sixth act, which we're calling Emmanuel.